Good evening from Plug Hit Studios in Largo, Florida. I'm Scott. I'm Abram. And I'm Alante. And we are here with episode 471 of F5 Live, Refreshing Technology, a proud part of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. This week, iPhone turns 10, governments go overboard, and an internet petition finally works. Yay! Wherever you are and however you're accessing our show, whether it be Facebook, iTunes, the podcast Play app and the Windows Store, um, Google Play Music Podcasts on Android, or the myriad of other podcatchers, our homes on uh, Livestream or Stitcher, or any of the number of places that we are live right now, Livestream, Periscope, Mixer, and YouTube Live, uh, or, of course, on our apps, pluggislive.com slash apps. You can get them for free for uh, the Windows platforms in your life. Thank you for making us a part of your day. This, as I said, is F5 Live, refreshing technology, the flagship show and the Plug Hits Live family of content. We are live every Sunday night at about 9 p.m. for about an hour. We'll talk about the news of the week, gadgets, gaming, internet, and media. Avram, in a little bit, will talk about um, the uh, Couve uh robotic stem programming thing and uh how well that works in the pilch point and that brings me to the two ways that you can join us you can join us live by going to f5live.tv slash join us and you can see both of those shows as they happen or you can also uh, subscribe to this and all of our other shows by going to f5 live and clicking the subscribe button on the main menu from there, you can subscribe to F5 Live, The Pilch Point with Abram Pilch, our special events feed, which has a lot of stuff from Collision right now, um, our first look show, which will be back in a couple of months, and all of our other series there as well um, are all easily accessible. If you like our show, please tell your friends about it. Um, if you're watching us on Periscope, feel free to give us a couple of likes. We appreciate that too. Uh, but definitely uh, let your friends know about the show. It uh, it helps us get the word out. And I think that right there is the end of my spiel. Hey, guys. Hey. How is everybody? Hey. Doing all right. Great. It's, uh, it's good to do two shows in a row. It, it seems like over the last couple of months, our schedule has been surprisingly jittery. Yeah, yeah. You were asking me before, like, you know, usually I'm asking you, like, the day or the day before, hey, are we still doing a show this week? But I felt, I just felt my bones that, I knew I was ready, uh, you know, I, I felt my bones that, uh, since we said we were doing it, and that there were no special events, right? that, uh, that, that we'd be doing it, which, which we are, which is fantastic, because I <laughs> always love, because it's always a highlight of my week. And I and I've been preparing. I told my son that we had to build this robot kit today, oh. so so I could bring it because I wanted to bring it on the show. Very so cool. uh, so uh, yeah, it's it's been all right. It's been uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, you know programming this week, which is always you know always a great stress reliever for me. <laughs> uh, so. That's, no, funny. Yeah, that's funny. I see that with, I've been doing a lot of no programming this week for the other way at all, the other way around. It, it always adds stress to my week. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's mainly because they don't expect it of me at my job, you yeah. know. So it's not really my my job. Fair enough. Uh, but but I but I love to do it. So you know I do things like work on extensions and things like that, mm -hmm. and you know, working on a new one for the office. We do all kinds of things to like hack our various CMSs so it's like hitting a button in your browser works easier. Then I got to then I got to build this thing which was cool. So uh, you know, anytime I'm building stuff or, or coding stuff, uh, it's always uh, I, I enjoy the mental puzzle. Uh, Fair enough. Um, I, oh you said you were doing you were doing an extension for work this week. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, I do. Well, I do. I, you know, I think over time, I don't want to belabor it, but I, I... Uh-oh. Well, it's apparently that time of the show where Avram's face freezes for a minute. So, <laughs> in the meantime, Alante yeah. is uh, getting ready for a bit of a move. 
Yeah, I'm moving to uh, good old Teja. <laughs> uh, oh. oh, is he? Is Abram back? Oh, I'm back. Abram's back. There yeah. Okay. We had the. It's our it's our uh, weekly weekly freeze. Um, <laughs> I, that's what I said. I said it's it's that time of the show where Abram's fr- face freezes on the screen. <laughs> yes, it's that it's that time of week. So yeah, I always enjoy getting getting to do stuff and. Uh, as frequent listeners know, I actually do have one extension that's actually out in the Chrome store and has about yes. 12,000 users, which is called Silent Sight. So if you're annoyed by uh, by websites making auto-playing audio on you, mm-hmm. uh, you might want to check out uh, Silent Sight in the Chrome store because it will uh, will quiet you. It'll create a, a whitelist. <laughs> it's like a firewall for audio. Thank you. It definitely makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> taking care of that immediately yes indeed so Alante, you were yes. saying you're moving to texas yeah yeah um going to texas for a, for a fresh start um uh, now now for those of you who are listening and or watching that does not mean that he is going away from us no uh he will still be uh doing special events with us and stuff like that so no concern we are not losing Alante. right but uh i may not show up on the show every day <laughs> you know, but I, I'll definitely be in, uh, you know, videos and things like that. Uh, you will definitely see me at special events, so uh, no need to worry about that. <laughs> you're, not, you're not losing a friend. We're ex- gaining ex- a Texas correspondent. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I, I mean, actually, that's that's ex- that's very true because I may end up uh, uh, covering some special events going on in Texas that everyone else may not be able to get to. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely see, we'll definitely, definitely see. This week's Nifty Gifties on F5 Live is proudly powered by the Microsoft Store. Save 270 bucks right now on the Surface Pro 4. Uh, when you get it with the, uh, with the type cover bundle, uh, you can also, um, get the Surface Pro, the new model, this is what would theoretically be the five, um, and there's PCs galore on sale. But of course, the Microsoft Store is not just about PCs. We've got the Xbox One S with a bunch of deals and a bunch of bundles and that new lower price, uh, that just happened because, uh, the X is on its way. You can get Office 365. You can get uh, Xbox Live, as we we did here in the office a little while ago. Um, and then all kinds of other stuff, including the HTT Vive and all kinds of devices and services by going to f5live.tv slash Microsoft. Slash it. <laughs> slash those prices. I love that you are bringing back some of the old things that went away at some point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so uh, this week the iPhone turned ten, and um, I saw, and I think we probably all saw a lot of articles published by a lot of uh, websites talking about like the ten ways that the iPhone changed the world, and I read probably all of them. Hmm. And you um, read a lot, trust me, I was there. Yeah, I read a <laughs> lot of them for sure, and. Um, one of the things that I noticed was that a lot of sites were crediting the iPhone for creating things that it didn't. And I also know that a lot of people uh, believe that the iPhone created a lot of things that it didn't. And so uh, we decided to go the other way. We decided to create a list of things people erroneously believe <laughs> that the iPhone created. And um, I thought that would be kind of fun to talk about um like most people think that the iphone was the first touchscreen phone which drives me mad (laughs) no way no way is that true of (laughs) of course not because the palm pilot in 96 (laughs) well that doesn't count to be fair that's not a phone but there was the palm there i forget what it was called but there was the first palm phone yep was was like in 2001 or 2002 or something and, like that. And before that, there was the Compact Flash uh, GSM card that you could put into 
Yes. Any I palm, had one of those. So did I. I've got well, actually no, I didn't have it for the palm pilot. What I had it for was I had it I had I had a Palm three at one point and then I had a Cassiopeia E one twenty five and I had the C F card for that. Gotcha. Um we obviously many of our regular viewers know that I worked for Radio Shack for a very long time and we sold them in store. So and so that made for a touchscreen phone, but let's pretend not that. Um, even the Centro from Palm was out like three or four years before the iPhone. I had yes. a I had a UT Starcom PPC sixty six hundred in two thousand two. I yeah. think 2002 or 2003 that was running Windows Mobile. Um, obviously, I've been a Windows person for a long time. It's not just a new thing. <laughs> um, um, and then the 67 and the 68 and the 69. I had all of those. And all of those things hit the market before the iPhone did. Yes, exactly. The, the bottom line here, and as we go through more of these, it becomes it'll become more obvious, is that people are – Apple gets credit for popularizing things, and then people think that they invented – Ooh, invented bless you. Them. That, that just goes on top of – good thing <laughs> the picture's out, right? <laughs> I could just be sitting here, like, wiping my nose in the mic. No one would know. Anyway. <laughs> that um, sounded like a powerful sneeze, too. It did. Go ahead. Keep going. This is why I get the podcast mic for. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, you know, so they get credit for things. I mean, I've heard it also heard it referred to as the first smartphone. Yeah, that's the first thing on my list. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think there's an interesting argument about what was the first smartphone, but it's not even close to the iPhone. I mean, well, no, especially considering that the first iPhone by the industry was not considered a smartphone. It was considered a multimedia phone. Oh well. <laughs> Whatever, whatever you consider it, there were there were phones with that much or more computing power earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely, and definitely more features because the first two generations of the iPhone couldn't send a picture message. Right. So you had, I mean, so you had like forty dollar. You had forty dollar Boost mobile phones that had capabilities that the iPhone didn't have. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I remember there being phones that ran Windows CE. Mm -hmm. Uh which I thought was it was it called Windows C or was it called Windows it depends uh, on, Windows Mobile at the time it depends on it depends on the version uh, up through uh, four was called Windows CE five six were called mobile seven and eight were called phone ah and okay ten I'm not quite sure what they call it yes so so right so <laughs> there were those there and those were phones. And of course, there was BlackBerry. Yep, and Palm, and, and Palm, and Nokia with Symbian. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> right. So iPhone. I remember when Apple came out with it. I mean, I, somebody actually asked me the other day. This is a little ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> like, where where were you when it was announced? Wow. I have no idea. I, I mean, I I know where I was working. I know what I was. I mean, I wasn't. Uh, I. I was not working for uh, at my current job yet, although right. I it, I did a few like six months later. But I would uh, so the job I was at we 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 didn't do like breaking news tech coverage or anything like that. Uh, and I might have been on my honeymoon when it came out. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, see, see you know you uh, know what the difference is, right? Is yeah. the person that asked you that question they were extremely excited for the announcement. Uh -huh. So, of course, they remember where they were, what they ate that day, what they wore, <laughs> if they were wearing Although, matching underwear. Is it is it weird that I know where I was? <laughs> no. Maybe because you were excited the other way. I, <laughs> you, it was, you it was like, something that was going to affect us um, yeah. because I was working at Radio Shack at the time. Right. And yeah. I know I was at the store when the announcement happened right. because we got an email from corporate reminding us that just because we carried AT&T did not mean that we were going to be getting the phone because we were not. <laughs> ah, ah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, look, Apple gets a lot of credit for taking ideas that people had before a bunch and of selling it 
and selling it to the yes. to the masses. Right. Absolutely. And, and the iPhone is the best example of that. You got to give them some credit where it's due for for developing that tiny brand loyalty. Yes. Yeah. And but and the beginning of my article starts that way. With the the iPhone nearly single handedly has changed the telecommunication industry. If in no if for no other reason than it pushed other companies around it into trying to beat it. So it the competition created a whole thing because the other guys, Microsoft and BlackBerry and Palm and Nokia, they'd all gotten complacent in, in where they were in the industry. And the iPhone came around and everybody got scared and everything changed. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it became something where people wanted to have it. You know, like the other phones were, I mean, let's face it, I would absolutely buy it. But it wasn't something that, like, you know, that non-technical people would buy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or people who weren't in a business where they gave you the BlackBerry. Or in real estate, every real estate agent had a Palm. You know, and <laughs> I admit I admit, I was late to the smartphone game Me because too. all these people who were on iPhone, I didn't get it. Like, I was like, okay, so it's your phone. I don't actually get out enough. It did to, for this to matter, I make phone calls on my phone and then I go home. You know what I, you know, it didn't seem like it. It, it didn't seem like it was going to change my life. <laughs> you know, in a way, it sort of. And I did have the the Windows CE. I guess another thing that jaded me was that I had that Cassiopeia Windows CE machine at the time. I used to call it my bathroom reader, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, and I had that, and it was a, it was kind of bulky and everything, and like the web browser was crappy, uh, you know, because a lot of these mobile devices they didn't give you the full web experience, mm-hmm. right? And I don't think the original Safari was particularly giving you the exact exact uh, full web experience either. Nope. Yeah, I don't I mean, think so. I mean, you know, it, it was kind of uh, dumbed down the formatting and CSS and things like that. Uh, so what really turned the corner for me was at work one day when we got in the the first Droid, the Motorola Droid, okay. and people were talking about it and they liked it, and I was and I and one weekend I borrowed it and brought it with me and I showed it to my wife and she's looking at it and I was looking at it and I was like, well, I'm not really impressed with all these apps. Like I don't know what I'm going to do with all of them, but I do know that I can use the email and I can use the web browser, and and that and having those things alone uh, with me is pretty cool. Um, so, uh, but you have to think about now smartphones have kind of revolutionized how you, in, for better or worse, how you spend your time. Yeah. yeah. True. So in every you know. way and shape, <laughs> uh, one, one of the other ones that, that bothered me and then we'll move on to the next topic and everybody can read the rest of the article at plug it's yeah. Uh, the other one that bothered me was PC world. Um, and I don't mention them by name in the article, but PC World claimed, I think it was PC World, it was PC World or CNET, uh, the logo was red. One of them claimed that um, the iPhone uh, was the first device to have uh, phone-based GPS. And I almost threw my Surface Book across the room. <laughs> no, that was CNET. It was CNET? Yeah. Okay. So it was CNET. And I'm like... Are you kidding? My San- Sanyo 8300 from like 2002 had it, and Sprint gave you the service for free. <laughs> what? While Verizon was charging ten dollars a month for the for the thing on the Razor at the same time. <laughs> um. That I'm like everybody had it. <laughs> How, what are we talking about? And of course, my my uh, Windows Mobile devices all had it. I could use. I could use uh, MapQuest on it. Yep. I could use Google Maps on it. All no problem. So I don't. I never. I that one made me mad. Oh, that one made me mad. <laughs> I I specifically remember um, a trip with my friend Lisa, who, if you're a very long time listener, you might remember from like early 2007, 2008 shows. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> She and I took a trip to Las Vegas for a friend's wedding in uh, 2005, and we used my Sanyo 8300 and my Motorola Rocker because I've always been crazy and always had more than one device. 
Um, which, thank goodness, because uh, there were several places where only one or the other would work. So thank goodness we had both. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I remember, and people looking at me like I was crazy. But obviously I'm not. I mean, at least that's not proof of it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Man, it's interesting how things have changed with uh, with the addition of, you know, just smartphones in general. Yeah, because because the thing is, like, my mother had the same phone that I had, yeah. we, which is not an uncommon thing for us because she likes to have support from somebody who has the device. Yeah. So she, she had an 8300 as well. Mm -hmm. and she never used it because she could never figure it out. Um, to be fair, she can't figure out now either. <laughs> um, she couldn't figure it out on her Windows phone. She can't figure it out on Android. But um, so I know that like Google Maps on smartphones has made it a little easier because people, even when they had it for free on their phones, people were still coming in and buying Garmin and Mio mm -hmm. uh, physical devices. Yep. Um, because just touching the thing you want to do made more sense made to them than easier. using arrows. Yeah. Uh, are you still there, Abram? Yeah. Okay, just oh, wanted okay. to make sure. Uh, <laughs> since it's one of those nights, just wanted to check in on you. Um, so, so yeah, um, obviously the iPhone wasn't the first to do it. Uh, they weren't even the first to have uh, GPS navigation on a touchscreen in a phone. Yeah. Um, but again, like we said, it's not that a lot... Of, a lot of people credit Apple with the creation of things, which they did not create. Right. Uh, they did not create mobile payments. Japan's had them for a decade. Yep. <laughs> but Apple Pay made people know that it, it made, like, grandparents know that it was a thing, yeah. which is the big difference. Yeah. Uh, and, by the way, just as a public service announcement, app is short for application, not for Apple. Just had to get that out there. <laughs> because, I saw that twice. Because some people actually think that that's a thing. Yeah. That the well, app store is the Apple store. I what, well, what really peeves me is now that the word app is because also start to be used for appetizer. Are you serious? Yeah. 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 If you've ever if you've ever flipped on the Food Channel, which I don't <laughs> do personally, but my wife does, flip it on, you'll see them like on any of those shows like Chopped or whatever. Like, yes. Yeah, so we made our apps, and then also like even if you go eat at like one of these like I don't wouldn't call it trendy one of these chain restaurants like you know, Applebee's or something. They'll be like, and we have a special on apps. Oh, <laughs> oh I don't like. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? What? Yeah, I, I hate it. That's it's really bad. Me. You, you could at least say the, I mean, if you're going to do that, like, don't try and be, do they think it's cool now? Because it's like, oh, apps. People want apps. <laughs> I, I guess, I guess they're trying to, you know, just like, like how people, kind of like delish like i can't think of other words at the moment um on the fly but a lot of words have been kind of shortened in the last like year or two or three years or whatever to sound kind of cool and and hipstery so i guess i guess uh, appetizers has fallen under <laughs> that yeah i mean if you want to be cool like if you can't if it's too many syllables for you to say appetizer you could just say you could change it you could be like Tizer, do you like a Tizer? I mean, that, that that's not that that's not good either. Bad. But at least it wouldn't be trying to try to bite uh, apples or rhymes or whatever. It wouldn't be trying to. You, you know what I say for appetizers to make it sound cool? Yeah. And you can take this, kids, all of you watching. I say appetizers. <laughs> <laughs> I really do, a hundred percent. Yeah, he's not fooling around. That's that's a real thing. <laughs> I've got many more. I'll make a list someday. <laughs> it's true. He does have many more, but that's not what we're going to do right now. Not right now. We are, real, we are going to uh, move on now. <laughs> This week's Pilch Point with Avram Pilch is proudly powered by Monster Products. The headphones on my head right now, the Monster DNAs. Alante's got the uh, Monster Elements. They're Scots. Technically, they're the companies. Uh, <laughs> I do normally wear them, but yes, they're the companies. Um, and a whole lot more uh, available from Monster right now. And uh, because it is uh, 4th of July week, there is a big sale going on 
Um, right now, a whole bunch of 4th of July specials on headphones and speakers and the cables to connect them and the rest of your home entertainment system are all available from from HDMI's to the the um, Monster Blaster and uh, the iSport uh, headphones all on sale right now by going to f5live.tv slash monster. And of course, that music means that it is time for the Pilch Point with online editorial director of Laptop Magazine and Tom's Guide, Abram Pilch. Abram's still here, kind of. Yes! Yes, well, this is, uh, you can't see me. It's true. But, uh, eh. well, I'm doing a big jig uh, <laughs> with this, with this, uh, with this Kuv robot. But, uh, yes, I'm, I'm still, I'm still here, even if the internet totally isn't, isn't exactly here between us. It's true. So, we're going to talk about something that you mentioned last week on our 10-year anniversary show, um, a product that you had gotten in. We're excited about getting to see in action. Yes. So lately, uh, last few months, I've really been uh, – I've been making effort at Tom's Guide. We've been making effort to cover more uh, robot kits and STEM kits uh, for kids because, for, uh, first of all, uh, as a parent – uh, it's something I want to share with my son, although he's a little on the young side for a lot of this stuff. He kind of, I, I play with it, and he helps me put, put stuff together, and he's sort of picking up the basic concepts. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a, becoming a huge, huge market now. It's like everybody's coming out with some kind of a STEM toy. Yeah, and, and they're not, and they range from real cheap to real expensive. Uh, and, uh, but... Uh, the the whole belief behind them is you know your kids kids should learn about programming. Now in a lot of cases, there it's not just programming; it's also building stuff. Uh, so what I have here that you can't see uh, is the uh, Kuv. It's a new kit from Sony. It's not out yet in the U.S., but it's been out in Japan for a little while. It's going to be out th this fall, and you can actually. Uh, Believe it or not, even though this is Sony, the Sony, they're uh, selling it on Indiegogo, taking pre-orders on Indiegogo right now. Okay. And and they're trying to hit a hundred thousand dollar goal. Uh, I want to say I want to say hi to the people in the uh, the Periscope chat room who are talking to us right now. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so. So. Um, in uh, so, so they're they're. They don't need. They told me they don't need the money to make it because they already come. You know, they already manufacture it, uh, the Kuv kit. But that right. they wanted to kind of generate some attention, and if you order it there, you can get it a significant discount. Uh, which uh, okay. and discount is good because the kit is a little expensive. Um, there's going to be two sizes of kit: the uh, the basic kit and the advanced kit. And the advanced kit, which has all of the sensors and motors and 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 blocks is five hundred dollars. Okay. Uh, and the starter kit, which has most of the sensors and motors and blocks, is three is going to be three fifty. But if you order them now, it's like a hundred or two hundred off. Oh wow! But but like, let's get to the nitty gritty of like what it is and what it does. So um, so what it it's designed for kids ages eight and up. My son is five, and we are trying it together. It is a set of of plastic blocks. Uh, that work a lot like Legos, but they're not Legos and they're not Lego compatible. Uh, that you that you put together, um, and they have, and they connect to something called the Kuv Core, which is actually underneath it a modified Arduino board. Uh, but it's easy to connect to. There's no pins or I mean there are pins, but it's all plug pluggable. There's no soldering or you know, any of the stuff that people are used to making yeah. uh, things, you know, in the adult way, you have to do, you, you know, that there are wires that have plugs at the end and you plug them in uh, to the various sensors. And so um, this, is, this is more modular than. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's more modular, but it's it's closer to real making than, let's say, 
Uh, I think that's something like Little Bit, uh, like Little Bits, if you're familiar with that. Yes. Yeah. Um, although Little Bits is good too, but Little Bits is not really a, a programming thing as much as it is an electricity thing. Mm. Uh, this is so. This is more designed for programming. So, so how it works is you install the piece of Kube software, the so, Kube application. Uh, and by the way, in a very interesting and I would say controversial move. The Kube software is available for two platforms, and Android is not one of them. Wow. Uh, most of the time, what we see with these STEM kits is they're, they're mobile apps. They're mobile applications, you know. Yeah. So you can get them for Android, and you can get them for iOS. In this case, it's iOS, and it's Windows. Wow. Okay. Oh, and I think it, all, I think it also will run on Mac. Uh, but, uh, yes, Windows Mac, Windows, Mac, or iOS, but not Android. Uh, which is which is a little weird. Uh, so you install the application uh, on you know and on your iPad or your computer, and then um, it gives you a whole bunch of tutorials you can step through, and it's somewhat gamified, like you earn badges for, for finishing the tutorials. Oh, cool! Uh, and and they're very well written. Uh, you know the ones that I tried. Uh, so they're the tutorials that you can do. Then there are things called recipes, which really means uh-huh. pre-made robots you can make, and they have 23 of those. Uh, my son and I spent about three hours building the fire truck. Okay. Uh, nice. Because uh, uh, my, because for those who don't know, my son is a really big car car <laughs> truck guy. He, he loves that stuff. So you know, they you can make you can make like a little hippopotamus or a monkey or whatever, but he really wanted to make the fire truck. Uh, and the thing comes with four wheels and it comes with two DC motors. Uh, so you can make it into a rolling truck. Uh, the thing that's, uh, that's interesting is, um, you know, they give you, so they give you the instructions and there were like 77 visual steps to go through, to make this, to make this truck. (laughs) Now, now I want to, I want to emphasize that the trucks were the advanced things. Okay. Like I went from the, like, how to turn your L- I went from the beginner uh, tutorial how to make a LED light turn on, uh, <laughs> which if anyone's ever done that with an Arduino board knows that's like the equivalent of your first program or Hello World. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> basically, um, to to building this truck, and the truck has uh, uses two DC motors on the front wheels, and it has a uh, two servo motors which control the ladder that you can spin around. Oh, cool. Uh, and instead of controlling it from the computer, the code that they give you specifically for the truck is that you have attached by wire an accelerometer and a push button, and you can use those to like to drive it around. Although they're attached by a wire, so you gotta have to chase after it if it actually gets, starts going. Uh, but um, what's and then they give you what's interesting is they give you the whole code for these recipes. Then if you want to modify it. You can modify it, but you can't really save it, which is a little weird. Mm, huh. Your modification, and if you then there's a what's I guess called uh, not free play. It's called free free production mode, where you can like basically just design your own robot or see what other members of like the social community there have built. Sure. Uh, and uh, and that's pretty cool, except it kind of it kind of assumes that hey you. You're not just working on this. You want to like, um, you, you know, you're not just working on this. You want to share it because as soon as you go to like save, it's like okay, and give a picture and upload it, <laughs> and and uh, you know you can't like go back and edit something that you've already, uh, already like you've already saved or so whatever, which like is weird. weird. It, like, yeah, it's, once it's, it's out there, it's out there. I guess, but you know, these are supposed to be programs. Oh, right. and the programming language itself is uh, like for most kids' STEM kits, it's a block-based programming language, okay. which means that you drag a bunch instead of typing in uh, commands like if or, or logic things like if then or or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get a bunch of colorful blocks, and you could drag in like an if then statement, and then you drag a block for like, you know, what what condition it's meeting and what it's going to do like. If the accelerometer is turned, drive, drive the, move the motor so the truck goes forward, that kind of stuff. And you can do some fairly complex, uh, complex code with this. 
I wish that there was like a text code mode, but again, they're they're probably targeting eight year olds yeah, and they're to give hoping them a, that to give them a visual way to learn how all of those like little commands work, right? Yeah, so I, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, how they're doing it. Um, you know, uh, it's the blocks are really high quality. Uh, the fact that you're using something that even though it, it doesn't rec- register as an, a, a full Arduino board is like a real Arduino board, so you're getting kind of a similar experience. Uh, I think this is very good training wheels uh, for a kid. Uh, but I do emphasize that it's expensive. <laughs> You know, five hundred dollars to get the full kit—that's a lot. Right. Uh, and then, and then, once you everything that you build with it is really more of a proof of concept than a toy. Mm. So, like, my son liked the truck, but he's like, "Oh, I want to race it around." And it's like, "Well, you're gonna have to chase a wire after it, and really, you know, you can't like keep reprogramming it." It's. I think everything that you do with it, the goal is to build this thing, program it once. Then take it apart and build something else. Yeah, it's not, it's not for uh, build it once. Now that's that's good because you probably want to get that value out of your five hundred dollars and not just make it a, a truck and leave it. <laughs> right. right. Whereas there are other kits I've used like the GMU robots, which I really like a lot, which are more around the hundred hundred fifty dollar range, uh, where you really you could take it apart, but it's really made to make one one or two possible designs um so you know uh it's it's definitely interesting the tu- i think the real strength of this is the, is the tutorials because they're okay. just taking you through the programming and taking you through hooking up sensors they're very 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 well written that's good uh, like it's just and they have quizzes at the end multiple choice quizzes and you get badges so buy this if you've got a kid who's really who you're sure is going to use it <laughs> and is going to enjoy the tutorial portion of it uh, as much as they enjoy, say, hey, I've got, I want to make this trot, this toy monkey that is one of the pre-built recipes and just play with it. Because the point of it is this is very much a learning toy with the focus on the learning mm-hmm. uh, and not as much a focus on the toy part. Uh, but, you know it's fun and you know for me as an adult i lo- i love yeah I, I enjoyed the tutorials uh if only they would actually like use the tutorials to teach you like adult you know code like arduino code uh then they then they could really market this to like you know 20 year olds because you know it, it uh you know it really the tutorials they're teaching you are all about you know, making things and, and electricity and things like that. So, gotcha. uh, so that, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, that's just a quick look at the Sony Cove. I'll be put, we'll be putting up a review in a few days on Tom's and, uh, you can check it out also on Indiegogo, uh, where, where they're taking pre-orders still. All right. Fantastic. Very cool. Um, and, uh, obviously, so, Okay, so just based on what you've got so far, is it a? Do you think it's a a go or a skip? I think it's a go. Okay. I think it's to go. Okay. I think it's a go, but it only if you can only if you can afford the five hundred dollars. <laughs> right. And and you and you know for that money that your kid is going to want to go go through the tutorials. Uh, and, and spend time with it. If you get them, f- get it for them for the holidays or their birthday, and they open it and use it one time, you're going to be really upset that you spent five hundred dollars. Fair enough. Make sure your kid's a tinkerer. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So, uh, is the I don't know if you said it. Is the review up now or is it coming no. soon? No, coming soon. Okay. Today was my first day playing with it. This is fresh information. That's what oh. I, that's what I thought you said, but Hot I wanted off. to make sure. Hot off the presses, people. <laughs> Hot off my dining room table. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, when the review does go up, it will be on Tom'sGuide.com, and you can of course check out all of our stuff on LaptopMag.com, Tom'sGuide.com, and follow me on Twitter at @geekinchief. Fantastic. Ooh. Well, as always, I. Uh, 
I appreciate hearing about this. Just so you know, since we didn't have video, I pulled up the uh, website and had it uh, looping behind us. So, uh, cool. And on the on the live stream, so people could at least get an idea of what it looks like. Yeah. And I think the fire truck is one of the things on the website. So, yes, it's yeah. on the box. So that way, <laughs> that way, people could get an idea of what it was we were talking about. Cool. All right. Well, obviously for uh, for this show. Uh, we will see you next week, but we will continue talking to you for the rest of the the main show. This week's Extra Life on F5 Live is proudly powered by Razer. All of the gaming accessories you could really ever want, whether it be uh, a keyboard or a mouse or VR hardware, Razer has it. And just as a note, right now, through our link, you can get uh, select Razer Blade laptops and save you get up to $200 in games and additional software, which is something that they're running with us and a couple of other sites right now. I would like to make the point that if you go to the link, which we will give you in just a second, um, you will see Laptop Magazine's logo because it is a laptop uh, editor's choice. Um, so you can find... You can find all of the computers and all of uh, the accessories by going to f5live.tv slash Razor. Yes, Abram. Oh, I was just going to say yes. We review a lot of Razer laptops, and, uh, and they always get high marks. Uh, great, great stuff. Uh, and this week, I do want to – I'll put a, a pitch in. Yeah. We're putting up our best and worst uh, la gaming laptop brands. Yeah. Uh, article uh, probably on Thursday at laptopmag.com and Razer is one of the brands that we rated and I won't say who was number one but Razer did very well fantastic All right. well we look forward to seeing that out in the wild um, because we too are big Razer fans mm -hmm. um, in their computers and their uh, their accessories we have a couple of uh, the Razer mice around the office and uh, in fact, one travels with us as the, the mouse for the portable broadcast studio. Mm -hmm. That's how much we like them. Um, anyway, so let's talk about something that we don't get to talk about very often. A, a sanctioned uh, fan-made game in an existing universe. We don't get to talk about that a lot. We don't get to talk about that a lot in media either. Mm -mm. As Avram mentioned before the show, um, uh, CBS and Paramount are uh, mean when it comes to fan-made uh, Star, Star Trek stuff. Um, and so it's nice to be able to say that there is a, uh, a game called Installation 01. It is a uh, Halo game obviously it's non-canonical because it is a fan made mm -hmm. and uh they have been in communication with microsoft and 343 industries which is always weird for me to say because in my head it's still bungie that makes the games <laughs> uh, and 343 and microsoft are totally on board with this group making this fan made game wow. there are conditions but they are conditions that CBS was unwilling to uh, to concede on Star Trek stuff. Sure. It's definitely conditions that Nintendo is not willing to concede on anything. Yeah. Nintendo is mean when it comes to fan-made stuff. Yeah. Uh, Blizzard and Square are as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody like Nintendo. Nintendo is plain mean when it comes to fan-made stuff. But here's... Here's Microsoft and 343 saying, "Go for it. Just it can't be a it can't be a commercial product and you have to follow the branding guidelines." Boy, that seems that seems like nothing. That's pretty solid, actually. Yeah. So I mean, there are usually hoops that people have to jump through just to just to not receive a cease and desist. 
Right. <laughs> and just have no communication at all. Yeah. They were contacted by 343. Wow. Um, and 343 said, we just want to make sure you know this is not a cease and desist. We just want to have a conversation with you about what you're doing. And so uh, they put in a, uh, in a community update uh, this week that they have been, quote, maintaining a level of contact with 343 Industries over the past several months. months. Um, and that it's been incredibly informative and positive. And uh, they said, we have been ensured that Installation 01 is not under imminent legal threat, provided we remain non-commercial in nature, and continue to follow Microsoft's game content usage rules to the letter. Hmm. So stick to the branding guidelines and uh, don't turn this... Don't try and uh, beat Halo's profits, and uh, we'll be fine. Wow! So that's pretty good to see, right? Uh, right, Avram? Yeah. So how are they? How are they paying for this game? It's a fair question, and I, I don't exactly know. Um, I've been trying to figure it out. It is a quote fan-made game. I imagine they've got to have some kind of crowdfunding going on at this point. Maybe. But they obviously they can't. Microsoft and 343 don't want them to turn it commercial, so they can't yeah. like they can't do what a lot of crowdfunded games do and go way over their right. their goal. Mm-hmm. They've got to kind of keep it to cost time and time and materials. Right. Um, but one of the things that I find interesting about this is that um, they are handcrafting all the assets. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah. I see. I would have full on imagined that they. Have- that they were using all in-game assets to just kind of craft something, but they're nope. they're just completely handcrafting all of scratch? the in-game assets. Wow! Yes. So so there's no there's no artwork theft. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Quote artwork theft, which is one of the things that Nintendo freaks out about. Sure. There's no. Um, uh, I mean, th- I mean, there's IP because it's in the universe, but yeah. there, it's from what I understand, they're not using. Master Chief or any of that, right, right. and they're handcrafting weapons that look like they belong in the universe, but they aren't cousin weapons. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, the kind of thing that um, that uh, uh, prop guys make. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they aren't exactly a Ghostbuster proton pack, but <laughs> you know what they are you when you see it. To be, yeah. But it's not one. Sure. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Yeah. So that's got to be a lot of. I mean, yes, people can yeah. volunteer, but and it's pretty much mostly time uh, someone on the computer. But that's a lot of people's time oh, that's uh, that they're that they're putting. And of course, you can make that argument about anything that's freeware, right? I mean, there's a lot of people's time building Linux. You know, uh, it's a lot of people's time building open source software that are are, are projects like that. So, you know, it's. Uh, it's it's interesting to see. I think where people do get in, in trouble the most is when they're crowdfunding. Like that's really what I think that's really what got Axnar. Is it was Axnar the the CB the uh, Star oh. Trek crowdfunded movie in trouble? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is is that they were crowdfunding it versus now? I mean, it also looked real bad because they had a trailer for it and they were using that to crowdfund yep. and they also had real Star Trek stars in it uh, I mean frankly it looked a lot better than like the last five movies so <laughs> you know uh, but other things have managed to to kind of to get away with to get away with things like that as long as they're not crowdfunding as much like if you've ever watched um Star Trek Phase Two mm-hmm. or uh, Star Trek Continues; those are two fan shows. Uh, the one of them they don't make anymore, but you know, like they never, they I I don't think they ever got in trouble because they didn't they didn't really they didn't they didn't have a crowdfunding campaign to right. to make money. Right. I think that's where I think that's the place where most people where the most trouble lies because if you're saying that it's non commercial, but then you're crowdfunding it, so do you really think that like Microsoft or CBS or whoever the IP holder is is going is wants to be bothered trying to figure out how much of that crowdfunding money uh, actually covered whether the crowdfunding money actually only covered cost or whether they were paying themselves? Mm-hmm. Right. 
So, so I'm looking at the usage rules, and they state that the the developer can ask for donations, but cannot sell, um, cannot sell the game, cannot sell uh, merchandise based on the game that features anything that's IP related. Like if they wanted to sell shirts that have the the io1 sure. logo on it they can do that because that's entirely theirs um but they can't even sell anything that's based on the ip so it looks like the the way that uh they could pull off any kind of uh income is through donations so it'll be interesting to see how it goes um the fact that that is the rule did not slow them down. So that either means that that was their plan all along, was that they weren't going to like commercialize else. it at all, yeah. or I, I don't know. But I mean, there are a lot of a lot of people or a lot of groups, you know, make games for the sake of filling that void. You know, like yeah. there's a there they feel like there's a story there or there's an aspect of this uh, franchise that they love that they would really like to explore, explore or come to life. And, um, you know, that's, that's all they want. Like they know that they're going to pour a bunch of money into, I mean, all of us have kind of done that in some way, shape or form, you know, it's true. Dumping a lot of money into something. We know that we're not going to get much back from it, but it's sometimes that's how I feel about this studio. (laughs) (laughs) Trust me. We, I, when, if I go and look at all of my art supplies that uh-huh. I've bought over the years, yep. oh my gosh, <laughs> I could I could be living real good right now. But you know, it is what it is. But I mean, that's uh, like I kind of look at this um, like um, uh, Smash Brothers. Getting back to Nintendo, yeah, um, the, a whole group made uh, a game called Project M. That was a modification of Super Smash Brothers Brawl. Oops. And yeah, it was fine. I bet that went real well. It was fine at first until they started gaining way more traction than anything Nintendo had out there. So, <laughs> especially when they were releasing the newest newest game, Smash Brothers yeah. 4. And that's when it became a big problem. Sure. And so as of you know, as of maybe two years ago, they they have had to cease mm-hmm. you know because it was just it was too much even though they maybe weren't making a whole lot of money for it, it, it it's just you got to watch what you do <laughs> absolutely you know and you got to watch what your intentions are as well so well it's it's nice to see that that microsoft is like microsoft has embraced a whole new culture under their new ceo and it is definitely reflected here. It's yeah. it's good to see that they're not afraid of, of fan art. Right. And hopefully that will be at least the trend with Microsoft going forward. And maybe when uh, other companies see not a financial detriment mm-hmm. <laughs> to the Halo franchise, mm-hmm. maybe you'll see other companies relax their rules too. It'd be nice. That's my hopes. This week's news from the tubes on F5 Live is probably powered by Rift Tracks. Make fun of movies. Or, you know, let professionals do it for you, because that's what they get paid to do. The guys who used to do Mystery Science Theater 3000 are back and doing what they do best, making fun of movies. From blockbusters to Hangar 18. I'm, I can't make this stuff up. Uh, Excuse they've me. got... A little bit of everything. The way it normally works is, for a couple of bucks, you download the MP3, play it along with your DVD, Netflix, Amazon, wherever you happen to have the movie, and laugh. Um, Of course, sometimes they mix it up, and they will do live shows. Their next live show. Avram is going to love this. It is a Rift Tracks Live, Doctor Who, The Five Doctors Live, nationwide. Wow. Yes. Nationwide, it's going to be August 17th. Uh, to find out what theaters it's available at and what movies they've made fun of, 
you can go to f5live.tv slash riff tracks with an X. Those guys are so funny. <laughs> yes, they are. We, uh, we watched uh, Birdemic recently, which is, <laughs> oh. which is my favorite because it's so bad that it's worth watching anyway. And then when they get done with it, it's even better. And, and Scott knew that you had seen it a dozen times. It's one of my it's one of my favorite. See, I, it's not even a B movie. It's, you know, it's just one of my favorite student Z, films, student films. <laughs> That I've watched a gazillion times, and I love it every time I watch it. And he was like, you got to watch the Rift Tracks version. Man. Sit down. We're doing it. Let's yeah. do this. And it, I did not regret a single second of it. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about uh, government and their interest in overreach on the Internet. Ooh. I know. We're going we're gonna to talk about a semi-political topic, but we're going to manage to make it as apolitical as possible. Uh, let's come at it from a purely internet perspective. Mm -hmm. All right. So this week, uh, two different com countries, not companies, mm -hmm. two different countries, um, passed laws or had court cases that allowed their country to exert their country's laws on the globe. And let's talk about what those are first. We have Germany, who had an interesting reaction to um, to World War II, and their laws have been very weird and draconian about things like hate speech mm -hmm. and uh, even owning something uh, with the uh, a Nazi symbol on it. Like they're it. It's they are very strict on it, which is their right to be. Absolutely. Because it's their country and you can move to another country if you would like to. However, <laughs> here's what happened. Uh, they passed a law that requires uh, social networks to remove or block any hate speech from their platforms within 24 hours or face an almost six million dollar fine. Apparently per incident, Ugh. which is a lot of money when you think about how many people post on Facebook, we can give you a good stat because Facebook said it this week. They, they made a big deal about the fact that 2 billion mm. active accounts per month. So if all of those people post once... Just once. That is two billion posts that have to be processed, whether by human or AI or algorithm or whatever, to look for hate speech. Apparently of any type. Oh my gosh. Now, is this, the, is this the case where they have to proactively find the hate speech? Yes. Or, or is it a takedown notice, like if somebody reports hate speech, they have to act on it in 24 hours? Proactive. Mm. Yeah. Yep. It's not like the uh, DMCA that says that uh, co <clears throat> a company with user-generated content must respond to uh, notices within a timely manner. This says they have to be proactive about it. Has to be removed within 24 hours, not 24 hours of notification. Wow. Mm. I think that's going to be a difficult law. I mean, that's going to be a difficult law for them to enforce. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I I have to think that that's the kind of thing that is going to end up in in court, either in the German court or the EU court or something. Yeah. Because that's a really, I mean, I guess I'd ask this: How are German-based website are, i mean are germany-based websites held to the same standard i would assume yes right yes so while facebook is a quote-unquote american company i mean it germany is a market for it it's right? true uh so you know places have to comply with the local laws of the market that that they're in uh i mean look at all the com companies that were not happy 
that, you know, the privacy things or the, you know, not happy with the terms and conditions that they had to meet to, to operate in China. So, you know, places, companies have to comply with the local laws at the same time. I, I would wonder, you know, how does the site, you know, are the lawmakers really thinking this through in terms of like having worked at a, at websites of different kinds that take user generated content, uh, for, you know, two decades now, uh, there's so much stuff that people can put up and you not see it right away. Yep. Uh, people have to have who are enforcing these, these laws have to have some degree of, uh, also how do you know what hate speech is? Right. Right. That's always the problem with this kind of thing mm -hmm. is what is hate speech? And what if it's, what if it's somebody who lives in, Japan, who's only friends with people in Japan, does that have to be removed? What if yeah. they're what if they're only saying mean things about China? Does that have to be removed? Or if it does it require a Japanese person to make fun of somebody in Germany? How, do they have to do it in German? Like in other words, like right. if it's a language that those people that the people in that country primarily don't speak. Right. Does that mean, like, does that have to be policed too, just in case they speak another language? Right. It's it's crazy, and it, it kind of creates a scenario where German law will affect... Because, you know, Facebook can't take down a post ju just from appearing in, in Germany when they take... I think when they, they could. They could probably set that up, but I don't think that that's in their setup right now because when it happened, when China tried to do something like this, Facebook just went away. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> they, I mean, they flipped the table and left the market. The same thing that happened when China tried to tell Google that they couldn't show uh, search results that included the word democracy. Google's like, fine, then we'll just... Uh, deal with oh, wow. every other country. Bye-bye. <laughs> and China relaxed that <laughs> policy some, but Baidu owns the country now. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, look, you're going to... This is this is a dilemma for those businesses because they mm -hmm. want to do business in those markets. Uh, and the markets, you know, they're, the markets have their, their own standards. Yep. I mean, I think, obviously, a lot of companies are are willing to uh, bend over backwards for China because it has such a huge market and everybody wants to get in on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's Germany so much business being, happening there that people are there and they want to be able to keep their service up and running for people who are, who are visiting on business and things like that. Yeah. But yeah, I can see this ending up in court, but I can also see if it, if it goes uh, Germany's way that either they get no Facebook or a very scaled back Facebook. Right. Mm. Or or Facebook sets up a scenario where they can block posts just in one country. Yeah. So, with that said, let's one-up it. Let's go to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um, a case made it all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court. And this week, the ruling came down. That said, Canada has the right to tell Google to remove search results... On a global scale, not just in Canada, which is where Google did it. They were asked to remove certain results, uh, and they did for Canada, which Google can do. Um, and Canada said, not good enough. <laughs> well, well, well. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Well, how, first, first of all, how do they know? Like, or do they have somebody trying in Canada with a proxy server that's not Canada to check? <laughs> it's a fair question. Probably. <laughs> or do they call someone in the U.S. or somewhere or another country just to have them check? Right. Exactly. I don't. I don't know. But the thing that I found most interesting. Well, okay. So obviously, it's fascinating that Canada thinks that they have the right to make a law that applies globally. Which, uh, of course, they don't. Even the UN can't pull that off. 
Um, but the thing that I found most interesting was it was a seven to two ruling. It wasn't even close. It's not like it was, you know, five to four. It was seven two. Three hundred sixty-five. <sighs> I think this is another thing that's subject to more litigation. But I mean, the if if Google or Facebook have to leave some of these markets, which seems very unlikely that they would leave Canada. Uh, I mean, Germany. Germany does have a history of kind of being really hard on, uh, you know, I think it doesn't, wasn't Germany really uh, upset with Google over Google Maps? <laughs> and they they actually had some type of thing where you could have things not mapped. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, to, now, to be fair, they got mad at Google Maps because Google was driving around the country mapping out uh, Wi-Fi hotspots and quote accidentally, according to Google, breaking into uh, Wi-Fi routers. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I could see, I could, I could see why why the German government wouldn't take kindly to that, <laughs> you know. But um, I mean, these are these are definitely going to be concerns. I mean, uh, these now the interesting question is if these countries if i mean this is looking very far ahead but if companies did pull out of canada or did pull out of uh germany who replaces them like is there is there a local you know is there a german social networking site but they're still would be held to the same standards right right yeah is there but it would be i I imagine it'd be easier for them to you know keep keep their social media their their enclosed social media in control as opposed to one that's based outside of the country, right? I like, guess likely. I mean, but they still face the same issue, right? You'd have yeah. to. I mean, and it, and it, and you know, I don't know. There must be some German social networks around, but also this would I assume apply to UGC on any media site, right? So if like Der Spiegel or something like that has a comment section, <laughs> uh. I mean, right? Like, yeah. and, and somebody posts a comment there. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the same? But wait a sec. Doesn't this, wouldn't this also apply beyond Facebook too? Like, what about YouTube or Absolutely. Twi- Facebook or Twitter? Absolutely. Or, or like, I mean, these are all in Germany too. Those, those are the big three that are being discussed um, kind of industry wide on this issue are Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. Nobody's talking about Google Plus because I don't know that Google has any employees in Germany. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm I sure love, they do. I love to make that joke, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, those are the three that are mostly being discussed. Uh, so yeah, it applies basically to any any social content. Wow. Well, that's a, that could be a lot. Yeah, God forbid there's a a, a political website in Germany. Whew. Mm, yeah, because that's going to be that'll get complex real quick. Because uh, people tend to, at least a small number of people that tend to be the ones that comment on the internet, uh, tend to uh, escalate political conversations quickly. Right. Yeah. So, Again, I, I guess my, my my final thought on this is like, how would they enforce this against companies that don't don't have a uh, a an office in and in a, Germany, like any official presence in Germany? Right. Like, yeah. if I'm running a website in my house. Okay, here in the U.S., and I've got a forum on it, let's say, and yep. people are posting things on the forum. Mm-hmm. How how are they? I mean, are they gonna have are they gonna have a fire uh, have a firewall or something where there's just IP fil- there? Like, is there gonna be a government run IP filter or something like that <laughs> that they're gonna do? Because if they can't, you know, it. it like Google obviously has a financial interest in Germany. They probably have offices there. Yep. They're cert- probably selling ads and things like that. Mm-hmm. But what would they do against a, con- a company that has no business presence in their in their country? I feel like they'd have no control over a place like Reddit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a like, good example. There's no, there's just no way. Reddit doesn't have any control over Reddit. No, they don't. <laughs> All right. So th- this is going to be an interesting one for sure. For all of the reasons we just discussed, because, I mean, this 
this is an undertaking that's going to require everybody in Germany to be an employee of the German government to be able to to hunt down hate speech. It's insane. <laughs> Make yeah, them it, do it. It's it's a clear case of somebody who be who of people who are who are don't understand how the internet works or don't understand how computers work. Like uh, when the senator had his uh, blockbuster, not blockbuster, it was a family run uh, VHS rental history uh, posted somewhere a, a federal law was passed that said you couldn't, that you couldn't even share your own rental history, which is why face uh, Netflix and uh, Hulu didn't have uh, Facebook share buttons. Mm. Until recently when the law was overturned because wow. it was somebody who just didn't understand <laughs> what it was that they were passing a law on. Yeah, don't know, don't uh, It seems to happen a lot. They yeah. Don't know, don't know, don't care. Yeah. Especially here. Yeah. It's anyway. the don't care part that's the most concerning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no no question about it. I mean, we could go on over so many laws like that regarding the internet that seem to be written by people who who. I mean, but, you know, we're like 20, year, 20, 20 years into the Internet age now, so there's really no excuse for people not understanding how the Internet works. Right. I mean, to, to be fair it's to a, Facebook... It's a series of tubes, right? Yeah. To be fair to these, go to these governments, though, the, the, for the big companies like Facebook and Google, their ability to, like, filter things and, and whatever... You know, they have the resources, they have the people, they have the money. Right. Uh, if you're asking them to filter something out for your country. Sure. It's just when you create a scenario in which you might or might not be asking them to filter content for the globe. The world. Is when it starts to get weird. Yeah, and, that and is whether weird. And whether or not you have the right to do that. That's, mm -hmm. when it comes down to it, that's the thing. Do, do you and I, Avram, do we want our websites to be controlled by a law passed by the German government? No, and I, I like I said, I don't know how they would enforce it. Right. Uh, I mean, I think it, it's really a matter of you can enforce things on people in other countries. Uh, I mean, uh, and you can enforce behavior. I mean, you can violate another country's laws without going to that country. The question is whether they can enforce it or not. Right, exactly. So and you can violate a state's laws without a, going there, without going there and not get in trouble for it. <laughs> It'll be th these will be fun cases to follow because, like you said, obviously, neither one is over. Yeah. This is just the beginning for both of them. Yeah. This week's DRM not included on F5 Live is proudly powered by Groove. Mm. All the music you want, play ad-free music from one of the biggest catalogs on the planet. You can listen on your PC, tablet, Xbox, smartphone, whether it be Android, iPhone, or Windows phone, uh, or just on the web if you don't have any of that. Uh, you also have the ability to download uh, music on up to three devices. So that if you are sans internet connection, such as me at the gym, uh, you can still listen to your music, no problem. Um, and right now, we are giving a free 30-day trial if you go to f5live.tv slash groove. Mm. Groovy. That is the only one that's still the groove. groove. It's kind of the only old thing that has stuck around. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, as it turns out, an internet peti petition finally worked. Uh, what? I, right? There's a lot of internet petitions. None of them ever seem to do anything. So this week we have a story in which one did. No uh, way. I don't believe you. The second season of the unbelievably expensive <laughs> Netflix series Sense8 uh, premiered. And um, Netflix had announced that because every episode costs more than double what an episode of Game of Thrones costs to produce, they would not be producing any more of them. <laughs> um, that seems like a good business decision because 
of how much people revolted the last time there was a price increase for Netflix. Mm -hmm. And if you were producing a show whose episodes cost double a Game of Thrones episode, which is insanely expensive as well, um, our prices were surely to go up. So, um, an internet petition then went around, as they always do. Nobody sent rice to NBC or anything like that. (laughs) It was... um, it was uh, an online petition, and enough people signed it that Netflix agreed to produce one more two-hour episode to wrap up the story. Wow. Yes. So, congratulations, Internet. You have finally accomplished something. Did you watch the second season? No, uh, for my own personal reasons. <laughs> I haven't watched. I haven't watched the second season. I watched the first. How about you, Ante? I've never seen it. Ah, huh. it, you know, it seems really interesting. It's just I've never had the. I never had the. Oh yeah, I'm going to watch this right now. Feeling. Yeah, you know, I saw it last year. Again, I it was a moment of, you know, once I start getting into a show like that, though, I end up just watching the whole thing in a couple of days. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Well, that's, like I'm like that right now with with Westworld. I'm almost all the way through Westworld. Gotcha. Which, by the way, on a side note, is awesome. You got to see it, but, uh, <laughs> and only because I have free HBO right now for for like a month. Is I'm binging it, but uh, it. but the uh, but Sensei. I mean, I I liked some of the characters. It was a little other parts that were just a little silly. It seemed, and then you know. It ended, and it was one of those things where it was like the first season was like uh, a year. Away. It was also over a year, you know, before they came out with the second season, mm-hmm. and I was sort of like, eh, I could kind of take this or leave this. Yeah, the yeah. show, you know, it's sort of how how I felt about it, and parts of it were just like eh, a little on the corny side too, mm-hmm. uh, and that. So you know, listen, I don't know. I, I don't know if Netflix has ever disclosed how many people watch the show, but you know, it's hard for me to believe that it's going to be more popular than their other shows that are really popular. Yeah. Like orange is the new black yes. or, mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, or all the Marvel shows, which, which I watch, you know? So in fact, I think that's the main reason I'm holding, holding on to my Netflix subscription is waiting for the next Marvel show. Especially uh, especially since they pulled The Office off this week. You know, yep. uh, I mean, to be f- fair, though, Netflix really does make a lot of original content, and they yeah. should, because the, in, in my opinion, most of the non-original content that they have on Netflix now, it's like, eh. Yeah. You know, it's never anything that I'm looking for. It's always like, this is sort of like what I was looking for, but not really. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? I, I like the stuff that they salvage, like uh, like Hannibal. I loved Hannibal. That was like one of my favorite TV shows ever, and it just disappeared because nobody was watching it for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. I guess nobody knew that this amazing gem was out yeah. there. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, so when they when they said that they were gonna you know pick it up as their little salvage, I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they've salvaged. They've salvaged some nice things, and they've, they, you know, and and for people who haven't seen some of the show, like you know, I, I do get cable, so if there's things that I really want to watch when they're first on, mm-hmm. I've DVR'd them and watched them already. Sure, but you know, for for folks who are cord cutters, there's a lot of great shows that that they can watch uh, that they didn't get to watch when they were first first on. Sure, uh, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, good good for people for filing a petition to do this. I mean, Netflix has been, generally speaking, they they are extremely responsive yeah. to fans, I think, more than any network I've ever seen. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's not the whole point of their bringing back shows mm-hmm. that yeah. otherwise people, I mean, I think to the point of a little bit of madness, like, <laughs> why did we need more Full House? Did people miss it? <laughs> who are the people that missed it? Who are the people that were like, oh, man, I just wonder what those, what, like, Uncle Jesse's doing now. <laughs> I am with you on that. I mean, yeah. as, as someone who absolutely loved 90 sitcoms, I loved them. 
I mean, it's it's all that was on, other than the awesome cartoons. But <laughs> but I mean, I wasn't like when they announced Fuller House and all of these other shows that are deciding to come back for whatever reason. I'm always left with a, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I mean, you know, is, it, is it, everybody it, alive? Like, <laughs> <laughs> do people really do people really need to see this? Like, right? There are some shows that I would love to see people bring back or resuscitate or whatever, but they're not like they're not sitcoms, right? They're not some of the shows that they brought back. So, think about it. if they were willing to bring back a show that they didn't even have anything to do with in Full House or you know other shows that they have uh-huh. revived revived from the dead um i think taking their own show and giving it a proper ending right mm-hmm. uh for the fans makes sense and remember yeah. in, in the world of netflix shows that they made are always always have value yeah yeah so they've added value to their own sh- to their own property right that's true right because if people are like, oh, it just ends on a cliffhanger, then you'd be like, oh, I'm right. not going to invest in watching this thing. Yes. So now, that's true. Now because, they're... because everybody knows going into it that the thing doesn't actually end. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. That's that's hard. You know, yeah. that's that. Like I've heard of shows that I was kind of interested in watching that were canceled after a year or whatever, and they're like, oh, but it ends on a cliffhanger. I'm like, ah, don't. so I'm going to watch all this, and then there's, oh, I don't know. Don't uh, watch the event. I did. Wa- I did watch the event. Did you? I, you're like I, the but, second person I've ever. Ru- I'm yeah, sorry. you're the I other. Mean, you're the other person. I, I watched it, but not on Netflix. I watched it when I was on. Same here. I watched. I watched it, it when I was on TV. I, wa- I I liked it. I feel Me like too. they were, they were at a point of some closure. But yeah, the it, it, aliens were coming. It, but it, uh, ended, it ended on the cl- like on the climax. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and again, you have something like that. <sighs> you could just kind of say, "Well, maybe they ended on their high point," you know, because I'm not sure that it need. We really needed more. They should have just left it there. Like, for example, this is a real controversial thing to say, but I think if I and I I, I love I would have loved to have had good sequels, but I think if they had cut the Matrix off after the first movie, I agree with that. They. Pr- it would the reputation of it would have stayed intact Mm -hmm. and people would have been like well he obviously goes on to save the day and that's great you know like (laughs) yeah like uh, so but yeah especially in that franchise Mm -hmm. but you know because if you do if you do it really poorly you can like poison the memory Mm -hmm. you know i'll bring up the third movie definitely damaged my overall impression of that franchise (laughs) Uh, both two and three poison it for me. Yeah. Like I used to, yeah. like there was a time when the Matrix was like my favorite movie, and then I, then when the second, third one came out, I was like, why did I like this again? <laughs> and, so and then there are some movies that are kind of odd, like uh, like Tron and Tron Evolution, where Tron Legacy, Tron Legacy, sorry, Evolution was get your not, Trons was, right. Yeah, that where where it's like, yeah, they made a sequel, but they don't really play together. But it's, but they weren't, but it wasn't bad, you know, but like, but you're left with, yeah, this is the sequel. And yeah, you know, they've got these characters kind of tying in together, you know, like it's weird. They didn't ruin each other, but they're still kind of standalone. They're very different (laughs) because they're like 30 years in between each other or something. Well, yeah, there's definitely that. (laughs) Yeah. Basically, Tron Legacy is just an awesome music video. Like if you think of it, (laughs) if you think of it as like a continuous Daft Punk music video you're right sort of sort of like interstellar i don't know if you ever saw interstellar what was it six six whatever it is i have uh like which is a constant anime for those who haven't seen an anime cartoon with just no words which is daft punk song (laughs) like if they had just done that without even without even having any dialogue that's so it would have been great that is so funny it would have been it would have been great so <laughs> so anyway, since since we've now turned to a movie show, I I do think uh, I think it's good, you know, good for the fans, whatever. But let's yeah. not rule out let's not rule out Netflix's self interest here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it was definitely in their interest to try and for sure uh, add value to the show by putting an in, a proper ending on yeah, it. Yeah, because because it's not like Netflix is NBC, right? Where things come and go, and it's it's a sea of 
of constant change Mm -hmm. with with something like this it's netflix they it's their thing it's likely to be around forever and so so to pull a heroes and just have a a cliffhanger and then walk away is infuriating (laughs) Right, exactly. So now they could put a they could put a nice end on it. Yeah, it adds value to their show in the cat back catalog, which you know there's enough back catalog stuff you could spend a long time watching Netflix stuff. Right, you know without them making anything new. So uh, that's true. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that is a good point. You know, so and that's so you know yeah it's uh, good good for them good 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 for the fans. Uh, I. I just hope. Uh, I mean, Netflix. I think has done a really, really good job of producing its its own content. Yeah. Uh, I think they've done an exemplary job of producing content. And they've done a good job of recognizing that they are not CBS. You know that they're not a traditional broadcast network, and that their business model is different. And, and I I like that they are recognizing that, and they're trying to deal with that, like with this decision here. So. Yeah, I mean, you you really I really wish Netflix had gotten the opportunity to make their own Star Trek, which uh, yeah I know was a rumor for a while, because you know now we're gonna see what's like when CBS tries to do that. Yep. Oh man. And uh, <laughs> I, I I you know it, the trailer looks great, but uh, you know again they're not doing the Netflix style right. right. I mean, did you hear that with Star Trek Discovery they're just gonna post a new one every week? Yep. And then they're going to take a hiatus for a few months and post a few more. Yep. They're going to treat it like broadcast. Yeah, they're going to treat it like broadcast. So uh, it's interesting, you know. Yep. The the old appointment television media treating the internet like it's old appointment television. <laughs> Hooray. Yeah, yeah exactly. Now I, I do really wonder how much do we know about Netflix's like uh what they consider to be ratings very little yeah because even like like with their recent um rating like their scoring differences now like uh, it it, it makes it even it makes it even weirder because before you could see the not only the rating but couldn't you see the number of votes yeah so now you can't even see the number of votes it's just percentage and what does the percentage even pertain to yeah what is the percentage of i don't know like so. it doesn't seem to necessarily but, be like approvals but i can tell you that nielsen does actual ratings what you're talking about avram uh yeah. for netflix so that means that if you have an industry connection you could probably get those numbers um but it wouldn't be easy ah uh, but yeah but nielsen does netflix ratings now so that's good it's just interesting to wonder what they consider success, right? Because they don't sell advertising; their only sale is to make sure people don't cancel. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So their incentive has to be pretty low. Like we just have to do enough so people don't cancel, but yet they yet they keep producing great stuff. Right. Yeah. I I don't know. I would love to get that information. We should try and get a uh, somebody on in the future. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. It's worth a try, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And on that note, that is our show. This is a long one. It was. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Oops. Um, for those of you who are joining us live, uh, thank you for two things. One, for joining us live. And if you're on Periscope, thank you so much for interacting uh, in the chat. Uh, and number two, thanks for putting up with the technical difficulties that we had early on in the show. We had lots. Um, and uh, for those of you who are uh, watching on subscription, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So <laughs> it's okay. Things happen. Anyway, um, so thanks for joining us. Whether you're uh, joining us live or in subscription, we appreciate it. As we said at the top of the show, uh, if you like our show, please... Uh, let your friends know about us. It's easy to get to us, f5live.tv. Uh, definitely feel free to uh, to share that around with uh, people that you think will enjoy the show because it definitely helps us out. Uh, you can also find us on a myriad of platforms, um, uh, YouTube and Facebook. Um, our pages there 
have all of our videos uh, as they're produced. They're published to the RSS and to YouTube and Facebook, so you can find us there if you don't want to subscribe on RSS. That's okay. You can find us on iTunes and Google Play Podcast Music, uh, the Podcast Play app in the Windows Store, and then in lots and lots of other places as well. I was just going to say find and follow all the things. Yes, find and follow all the things. Uh, if you go, if you go to that subscribe page, uh, we've got links to all of our social media there, so you can follow us in a myriad of places. Um, I guess uh, with that, uh, on behalf of the staff that's not here, I'm Scott. I'm Abram. And I'm Alante. And we will see you guys back next week. Ciao.